Harkin took Ash steadfastly to their small journey's end, and into a place with pillars and halls and corridors, white, all white, and made of stone, thick and carved, until they were at the very center of the edifice, which halls, the halls of which seemed to go on boundlessly, as if they had no ends. Nonetheless, there, there they were in the center of it, a presumable end, at the, at, and that, precisely, is where Ash's journey began. <clears throat> As they entered, Ash noticed the detail and decorum of the room. It had steps, each leading downwards and creating an, an enclaved square which would have appeared as a pyramid had it been solid and flipped around except for its head or its base, in this case, w case which was square or rectangular. It was hard to tell which. There sat many men, each in black cloak, hooded some of them, some of them their hoods down, and others with none at all. And others were dressed more commonly, and some who, simply put, seemed downright wealthy, because of their garments, of course. Ash looked like one of them, and so he stood out in the crowd, but only to some of them did he seem odd, or odd enough to give a glance, rather, as few did, uh, did much otherwise, except remain as they were, settled there, sitting and waiting, presumably, for something to begin. What is this place? Ash asked Harkin. But no response did he give, just a grin and a nod as he took a seat upon the uppermost steps of the enclaved square. Ash soon followed thereafter him and sat next to him, now waiting, a nervous itch beginning to ache within him that he was in a place he ought not be, but with a fury of heart that he could not move himself and a curiosity like that, like the halls that led him here, seemed to know no bounds. He wanted to wait for whomever, for whatever it was that was to come, and he would embrace it, whatever it was, surely as he had likened to hearken. Surely as he had likened to hearken. Or so he hoped so. Nonetheless, the room proceeded. As one man did enter, this man too a cloaked man, though his garments were white and not black in color. He led quite obviously, though it was not obvious at least to ask exactly what it was that he was leading until, of course... The words that he uttered, spilling out of his mouth in an almost serpentine way, did convince quite matter-of-factly that he was, did convince Ash quite matter-of-factly that he was indeed in the wrong, yet given the circumstance, correct place. Brothers, said the man loudly, brothers, permit me to tell you something of this guild, of this place, as it is obvious to me that some of you are quite new and perhaps that it is uncommon for the rest of us to witness. He did not hold it. He did not hold it for long, but the man's gaze did fall upon Ash for but a moment, which would have sent a shiver down Ash's spine, given the man's stature and tone of voice, as he was a lean yet large man, and it was not for his own hearty stature and, tra and tranquility of mind, which rough, long years of sailing it had thus far blessed him with. Ash might too have been impressed, as some of the others did appear to be. So far, however, he was only but angry and a little, little critical of the man that he should be so proud and, and and prudent and so obviously so but nonetheless he did listen i will introduce myself pardon me said the man cloaked in white i am herrick hellstrom of a house that you you would not recall the name of as my family did pass long ago and it was of no repute the likes of you folk no offense given uh, it was no. Uh, it was of no repute to the likes of you folk. No offense given. I am master yet now of this house, of this guild, and of our family, of our small yet fortified brotherhood. Perhaps even he hesitated a moment. Perhaps even you too. You too shall be a part of our order of thieves and bounty killers. Perhaps not. He paused again and then said, "This we shall soon discover." Herrick Hellstrom walked off of the square or rectangle, whichever which where he had stood. And though Ash should have been nervous or reluctant to partake, when they called for the newcomers to stand, he did so nearly gladly. And with a heart full of such a fury, he would have smelled his own anger had it, yet, had it not been for the, st the staunch stench of drunken liquor. Besides, what more did he have to lose? His wife dead, his voyage to sea delayed, his rage evoked. He would partake in such a game as combat sport, which is, which is precisely what it was that Herrick had called for the men to do, to fight, not to the death, but to determine rank. They rounded up the newcomers quickly and orderly, and one by one they set them to walk to the next room and to wait therein for further instruction, instruction uh, as to what to do next. Ash, despite some feelings of discomfort, discomfort that he should leave, felt for one that he could not if he wanted to, and for two that he did not want to. 
No, he wanted to rank amongst these men, these scoundrels, the likes of whom he was all too familiar with. And so with his heart heavy and aflame, he entered into the room parallel and did wait for further instruction, obediently with some disgust at the guardsmen who ushered him in. As he was readying himself for fighting, something too he was not at all unfamiliar with, unfortunately. And by the time they had entered, or nearly so, they had been lined up one after the other and told to face the wall. They were given clothing to wear, simple gray cloaks, which none of the others had been wearing, and told that these kinds were for the newcomers, that is, until they completed their first contract. But whatever a contract was or what it entailed, Ash did not yet know. He, however, had his suspicions. And his suspicions could not be far off as they dropped heavy sword and shield in front of them and told them to pick them up. It seemed, as was apparent, that the that they were indeed to fight de to determine rank, to which Ash gladly responded by picking up the sword and shield and assessing their weights. Feeling the steel of the hilt of the sword and the handle of the shield in his now iron-gripped fists. They were not cheap weapons, he could tell, but he was not a cheap man. Harkin had known this, perhaps, or perhaps it had been that obvious. Nonetheless, the guardsmen continued cloaked and hooded, cloaked and hooded in black save one who removed his hood as to, as to speak with them he had no beard he was clean shaven and standing in the center of the room just in front of the newcomers ash could tell immediately that he was there, there simply to give instruction and to ash he held no import the man who interested him the most the man of this guild is that what he had called it herrick that was who interested ash so ash paid hardly any attention until finally as was inevitable ash had known, Herrick did enter, his hood removed. It was not but a moment before he spoke. Tell me, said Herrick, who, who here is the best man? None raised their hands. Herrick laughed. One of you must be, he spat. Come on, he encouraged roughly. Tell me who, who is the best fighter swordsman, killer in this room. Ash took a moment, but assessing the other men, he finally, after a moment, raised his hand and said, perhaps myself. He did not know what had gotten a hold of him. Perhaps yourself, said Eric, walking towards Ash and eyeing him up and down. Herrick was nearly a head taller than Ash, though of a similar frame. Or perhaps not. Ash said nothing but stared at the man, a determination creasing his brow. Herrick only laughed, and it was not until then that Ash noticed that he walked with a slight limp on his left side with his left leg, though quickly. Ash hid his surprise. Herrick continued and said simply, Then let us begin.